welcome all of you and thank you for joining us today for the uh, Texas Section ASC webinar. It's titled The Impact of Virtual Design Technologies on Engineering and Construction. I would like to thank the branches for hosting the viewing sites across Texas. As the State Association for Civil Engineers, we're happy to provide this service to the engineering community. If you're not a member of ASCE or the Texas section, I invite you to become a member so you can benefit from being part of this professional association. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter for today, Jim Jacoby, PE. Jim is a senior principal and chief information officer for Houston-based Walter P. Moore, one of the leading engineering consulting firms in the nation with offices nationwide. In his position, he's responsible for the firm's overall technology strategy and programs. He also leads the firm's technology consulting business group, Walter P. Moore Technology, LLC. He is a registered professional engineer in five states. Uh, Mr. Jacoby uh, began his career as a structural engineer and has served in progressively more responsible engineering and management positions, including VP and chief engineer for Brown and Root, and prior to joining up Walter P. Moore as Chief Information Officer for Halliburton Company. His areas of expertise include implementation of integrated project management systems, building information modeling, and other related 3D CAD project delivery systems. Jim has had a leading role in the implementation of BIM delivery systems at Walter P. Moore. Jim earned a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Civil with a specialization in Structural Engineering from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He is a member of Tau Beta Phi and Chi Epsilon Engineering Honor Societies and has served on a number of committees including Chair of the University of Houston's Industry Advisory Board on Training in Advanced Plant Design Systems, Electronic Data Management Task Force for the Construction Industry Institute, and the AE Productivity Committee of the Construction Users Roundtable. He's an emeritus, emeritus member of the advisory board for the College of Engineering at Texas A&M and the advisory board for the College of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. And now I'll call on Jim to uh, make his presentation. Jim. Uh, th thank you for that introduction, Bob, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the title of this presentation is Impact of Virtual Design Technologies on Engineering and Construction. And so I'm going to talk um, uh, across a relatively broad landscape of how BIM, and I'll, I'll use the terminology BIM, Building Information Modeling, as the, uh, the moniker for virtual design and construction. It, it's typically what we hear in AEC space. Uh, what I'd like to do is provide a, a general introduction and overview of the, the process of BIM or virtual design, talk a little bit about the design platforms, common platforms, go through some project examples, and focus on uh, the benefits that uh, we have seen uh, leveraging this technology over the years, all the way through uh, from design all the way through ultimately uh, into facilities management, which we'll, we'll close with. During the presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the emergent technologies that we see um, entering this space um, and give you a, a view of that. So by way of um, introduction, I'm going to go through this uh, quickly. Uh, what you're going to be hearing me talk about in, ter in terms of BIM is really uh, taken from largely from our experience at Walter P. Moore leveraging this across the industries. Um, we're about 750 people. All of our practices are engaged um, leveraging BIM. We do practice um, globally. We do have some um, offices internationally in uh, Pune, India, as well as Panama and a few in, uh, in Canada. Um, the practice areas of our firm are shown on this slide. So we're structures, diagnostics, infrastructure, and technology consulting. And I think interestingly enough, um, all of these practice areas are heavily engaged in uh, leveraging virtual design technologies. And we'll talk about 
a few of the examples and, and really the benefits we've seen materialize um, uh, to these practice groups through leveraging the technology. We have been engaged in BIM for um, about a decade and a half now. We started in earnest uh, with a shift, a pivot in our structures group to um, the, the Revit platform on the structural side back in 2005. So we had our first training program. So uh, we have been a, we have been in this space for a significant number of years. Have, have kind of stepped on all the landmines there are to step on, and throughout that engagement, uh, have really come to understand um, the benefit associated um, with this technology. Uh, the folks at uh, McGraw Hill. Um, um, a few years back, introduced this concept or claimed this concept that BIM is quickly becoming the gold standard by which firms do work. And, and I would uh, today, I would really take issue w with that and say it's not quickly becoming the standard, it really is the standard. And, and where we see uh, companies who are really uh, making a difference in project delivery, they're always engaged in um, leveraging this. Uh, data-centric design philosophy as opposed to um, drawing-centric, uh, which is where our industry has come from. So it, it's really important to understand that uh, the building information modeling process or the virtual design process, however you want to refer to it, is all about a consistent digital representation of, of various discipline models. Um, there's rarely, uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever encountered or encountered a project where there has been uh, just one BIM model. You, you have several. You have one for each discipline: structural, civil, uh, mechanical, fire protection, electrical, site. Um, all of these digital models uh, come together, and the important point about it is that. The ancillary deliverables to the project, uh, from drawings to material takeoffs to visualizations to um, finite element analysis, all of these kind of things are derived from that single digital representation uh, or the BIM. So for an example, here is a, uh, a Revit structural model of a uh, courthouse. This is one of the, the first projects that we actually did back in the, uh, um, the 2005, 2007 timeframe. And you can see that this is very visual. I mean, you can, anyone can look at this, not just a structural engineer, and get a sense of the building components. Um, but furthermore, you can actually drill down within the, the BIM platform like Revit and interrogate um, the components, uh, the columns, the floor slabs. Uh, interrogate, I mean, find out what material they're, they're made of, what, uh, what the uh, rebar design, the reinforcement design is, all those type of things. And so BIM had planted the seeds uh, in our industry for allowing data that is used downstream by downstream participants to exist in, um, in this deliverable and then be transferred. Uh, which was is a huge advantage. Uh, it's one that isn't fully leveraged, by the way, um, in uh, 2020. Uh, but uh, the uh, the technologists are still working on it. So you know, here's an example of spawning those deliverables. You have the BIM BIM model upper left, and we can extract things like analytical models um, and drawings directly from. The BIM model. So, what that represents to the traditional delivery change, chain is a huge improvement in um, quality uh, and speed uh, of production. Uh, the age old problem uh, for the industry that was based on a drawing centric approach is uh, you have to revise drawings. So, when a change occurs during design, which it does on many, many occasions, um, that change has to be accurately reflected in all of the subsequent drawings. And that rarely happens, um, and it is uh, fodder for the lawyers in our industry. You know, claim litigation, 
um, that kind of thing. So one of the chief advantages of this data-centric approach to design is a consistent representation of your design that then can be used to create uh, everything else that project team members are, are going to be looking at. Um, so another way to show that chart, but uh, a little more visual here, everything coming off of the BIM. Um, in the, for civil engineers, you know, they, they don't really necessarily like the terminology BIM, Building Information Modeling, because they're working with uh, sites or working with underground utilities, uh, profiles, and, and what have you. Um, and so uh, that's fine, but the concept is um, absolutely identical. There is a representation, a di digital representation of whatever the design construct is that is then used to produce um, all of the project deliverables in the, the civil side. Uh, here's an example for example of um, um, roadway design, plan and profile in the digital world using civil 3D, uh, which uh, we see uh, as one of the prime movers in the data centric space for civil. Here is another example of uh, underground utilities. This happens to be um, in the Texas Medical Center on Fannin. So um, really adv advantageous for design work um, in that area. For those of you who are familiar with the medical center, you know how congested it is and all the new construction. Um, so using this technology to help plan excavations um, is, uh, is very helpful. Throughout the course of the last decade and a half, we've seen BIM mature in terms of its use to now touch virtually every aspect of the design process. Um, heavy on visualization and uh, introducing an entirely new process for coordination and collaboration among project participants. So you're not, pace, you're not um, passing paper drawings around. You're actually working with these um, dynamic 3D models and you can see changes uh, in real time. So collaboration has been huge. I think we've seen um, as I said, a sea change in how the industry works within a single firm and their partners, clients, and owners with this type of uh, material. So common BIM platforms. Um, this is a, a little bit dated slide, but I think uh, it is still very accurate from what we see. Uh, in the AEC space, when you engage, particularly in the domestic U.S., in um, virtual design technologies, if you're on the structural side uh, of the uh, field, it's uh, really almost all, all Revit. There are other alternatives, but I think Autodesk has, um, has captured that market. Um, Bentley is also a player. Um, we see that showing up on, on the civil side, and in the Autodesk world, we see Civil 3D. I'm sure that, you've, uh, that you are familiar with these platforms. Um, you, we look at surveys that are performed every year uh, by um, various companies on the AEC space focused on technology, and we see this consistent uh, pattern of uh, Bentley and Autodesk being the, the primary players. I don't know how long that's going to last, um, but they have certainly been successful here over the uh, relatively long term. There are certainly other digital tools uh, that are used. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of these, um, but what I'm showing on this slide uh, are pretty much the technology stack that w we use across our practice lines that Walter P. Moore. So Revit, Civil 3D, InfraWorks. Um, we we have. I'm going to talk about generative design technologies like Rhino and Grasshopper, which are becoming, I think, the new leading edge um, uh, to the firm. Uh, but these will become familiar names to anyone who who enters this space. Uh, I wanted to go through some project examples here just to give you an idea of the fact that there is no um, job too small, there is no job too big to effectively leverage um, 
virtual design uh, technologies. Here's the um, Yum Arena that we did in, in Louisville. You can see that um, the technology was used early on to uh, design several different uh, roof support schemes and be able to visualize those with the contractor and the client. Um, uh, here's another example, um, early planning and, and coordination. And um, th this kind of work process coupled with generative design that we'll talk about later is extremely effective uh, early on in the design for optimizing um, a configuration. We, we actually use the term optioneering uh, to demonstrate uh, to clients and others, all the project stakeholders, you know, several different scenarios, which historically in our industry, uh, though it was not feasible to do so because you simply didn't have the time or the money to independently do a conceptual design on several different alternatives, where today um, you can uh, push out dozens at uh, almost the drop of a hat. Um, this particular project made heavy use of the, the 3D model for coordination of um, equipment up in the roof trusses. Uh, another project that I think is, is noteworthy um, is the, uh, the Marlins ballpark. This was um, retractable roof uh, ballpark, very complex geometry. Um, I don't think that there was a 90 degree angle in uh, existing in the structural system. And on this particular project, we, we had to do the design in, uh, in Revit uh, to provide um, models and sheets to the other disciplines, uh, principally the architect. But we also progressed a uh, Tecla model, which is a, a 3D technology that is used by many steel fabricators. And we were able to actually design the connections and turn this steel detailing model over to the steel fabricator during the process of, of design. Um, so that had a significant impact on the uh, design schedule because we were able to get um, the detailers directly involved in our models and actually progressed to this concept of electronic shop drawing approvals. Um, using that native technology where um, paper drawings, uh, you know, that whole process of um, the, the detailer issuing paper drawings to the structural engineer to get them to approve the details or change it and send it back, that was all largely taken out of the equation because of this, um, this parallel review. Um, there's a, a picture of the, uh, the final stadium. So, how can you use BIM on the um, front end, the, the early days of a project? Uh, you can use simple tools for very rapid concept development. This is an example of a, of a SketchUp model. Not heavy on the data side, not data intensive. I wouldn't call it a BIM model, but it's very simple to construct 3D models for the team to um, collaborate with. Um, another view. Sketchup models. Um, these are real-time captures of the conceptual review that we do, taking excerpts from the BIM models with others. And as I as I've mentioned, it's just redefined the way teams uh, work together. It's an interesting um, roadway project or an observation tower for the raceway project. Um, all done using uh, virtual design. Even things as seemingly simple as uh, parking garages lend themselves to this technology, multi-office buildings, um, airports, uh, stadiums. We've, got, uh, we've done a lot of um, work on stadiums. Um, here's the, uh, the Chiefs current Super Bowl champion, champions. Um, you know, just I'm not going to talk at, at length about any of these projects, but just give you an idea of the the type of um, systems that can be used. So from the very simple to the very complex. There's the the Cowboys Stadium. Um, 
This is an interesting job that was uh, was done for Disney, um, the, their uh, mine train project, and it really showed how this digital um, model could be used to upend the traditional design approaches that uh, the Walt Disney Imagineering used. So what they would do in the drawing-centric stage of the industry is uh, really construct mock-ups of their attractions, um, put a full-size coaster you know, on the tracks, and they had a plywood cutout that uh, would represent the extents of the arms of the passengers flailing wildly, so to speak. And they take that plywood cutout and they push it through the mock-up of the attraction to check for clearances. Well, in, you know, in the digital world, that can be all done automatically. Um, the new uh, control tower at San Francisco. Here's um, uh, Gallier Center, which is, um, you know, uh, theater, performing arts. You can see in this view, get kind of a glimpse of the overlaying uh, discipline models. So uh, the message I want to leave there is whether you're on the civil side or on the structural side or on the mechanical side, um, this technology lends itself equally well, whether it's um, large or small projects. I think one of the biggest benefits that we've seen materialize out of leveraging virtual design is just the, the, um, the visualization aspect. So here's an example um, from um, Civil 3D and uh, 3DS Max, Studio Max. This was a street improvement project in downtown Houston that was done for the uh, uh, in advance of the Final Four. And so we had the team uh, leverage Civil 3D uh, and uh, Studio Max to actually recreate the streetscape associated with this. And we had one of our uh, team members actually drive the street before construction, take photographs of the uh, the buildings, and then they were able to map the, the building um, uh, imagery into the 3D model. So uh, a very photorealistic um, look at the design project. Here's another example, also in Houston, Allen Parkway um, redevelopment uh, project, which was uh, uh, really a fantastic uh, project for the city in terms of uh, changing this dynamic approach into town. But once again, using Civil 3D, 3DS Max, um, production tools, we were able to capture this imagery and share it with the project stakeholders um, to get um, permitting. In, in this instance, this video uh, found its way to city council and um, I, I, it also found its way to uh, TV on the news channels, but it was um, significant in using uh, the project details to inform the residents of this area of what the project was going to look like. Um, huge visual uh, play. On the model review side, um, we've got the ability to review fabricators' models, and so you're starting to see the type of detail that's finding its way into design. Um, here's a, a PT joint. You can see the rebar, the tendons in, in detail. Uh, uh, an interesting example of how you can leverage uh, BIM for visualization. This is a shot of the, uh, it's not the Reliance Stadium anymore, it's the NRG Stadium in Houston. Very complex reinforcement design on the four super columns. Uh, actually, interesting story here is the fabricator um, was maintaining that um, we actually designed a system that could not be built because of the congestion. So we leveraged the technology, again, kind of in a visualization play to go through and construct in the, the sequence of placing the rebar in the anchoring tendons, um, getting the parties to agree that, yeah, okay, this, this is possible and this is the process to do it. So um, what's key about um, the, the delivery process benefits in, in terms of visualization is what you see is what you get. You know, for those of us on the call old enough to remember that WYSIWYG acronym, acronym, what you see is what you get, this is what BIM is all about. Now, this is the, uh, actually the um, uh, 
the podium design for the Palazzo in Las Vegas. And um, a really interesting project, but all of the detail uh, can be looked at early in the design stage. And when it gets out to the field, um, it's exactly what you get. So we use this visualization um, to great effect in terms of reviewing designs uh, with project stakeholders. We're talking about visualization, and so I wanted to touch on an emerging technology of uh, virtual reality uh, that uh, we think is going to be um, a huge benefit to the industry. It's a little slow on the uptake to date, but it offers a compelling way to review and experience um, designs, your ultimate design when you're in early in the design stage. So it's an immersive environment. Uh, you get a absolutely different appreciation for the design space when you're in uh, VR. It has introduced another set of tools uh, to the game. So on the left-hand side, you can see all of our legacy um, design uh, platforms. I should have also put it um, over there, Civil 3D, because we've used it as that on that as well. Um, but on the right-hand side are the platforms that are actually leveraged to create virtual reality builds. We happen to use um, the Unity platform um, for uh, our studio. There's a new workflow engaged in this. Um, you start with a 3D model. Uh, but what actually happens in um, the VR build is that model gets um, tessellated. So you go from these discrete physical components uh, into a 3D mesh, which um, is essentially a collection of hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, polygons. And that's what the, um, the VR uh, gaming engines work with. So we've had to adopt um, the, the middle two boxes or this poly optimization to go from the 3D models that are produced directly into um, uh, a VR build. And it is um, very efficient. So you can see here uh, the little workflow that we use internally, irregardless of what group the models are coming from. It's kind of like as long as it's a 3D model, we can consume it and um, optimize the mesh and, and push out a um, Unity VR model. We can actually do this uh, via email um, with a build server. So it's a very effective way to serve up um, this compelling way to experience a, a project. Here's the um, Marlins ballpark. This is a Navisworks view. Um, so here's the Navisworks export of the FBX mesh. It's hard to tell it's a mesh from this image. And um, this is the rendering that actually occurs within Unity. Um, we also have the ability to manipulate the model. In this particular instance, we did kind of a fun little thing here where we put a batting machine, I mean a pitching machine, on the mound. And so um, using your controller, you could actually uh, try to hit the ball. And um, uh, it, it was illustrative in the fact of um, you know being able to demonstrate how you can manipulate model components uh, within um, the the unity VR build here is an example of some of the tool sets so it's a, uh, hopefully this video is coming through for you um, one of the key advantages we see in VR, it's not just a pretty picture, but by adding useful tools into the mix, uh, you can create a platform that has real value to uh, engineering design. Um, and we have used this to great effect on design reviews uh, with our own internal teams as well as with clients, uh, our clients, and the ultimate owner. So I think. Today, VR maybe gets a little bit of a bad rap because people and uh, engineers tend to think of this or equate this with, um, you know, the gamers. Uh, but I can tell you from having gone through this that it is a very uh, compelling way to look at your projects, and we think it's going to come on gangbusters. Here's an example 
of leveraging VR in, in practice. This was a study we did for the Rogers Center in Canada um, where you uh, they were looking, let me go back, where they were looking at installing new um, roofing material and they wanted to get a sense of um, what the glare, the shadows, the lighting would be uh, with that material. So we were able to use VR to do that. We have another example where we actually put, um, this was a parking garage for a hospital complex uh, that had a unique entryway, um, one way for physicians, other way for the retail customers. So we were actually able to put um, the clients uh, in the car and uh, drive them through this parking garage to give them the experience of what it was going to be like. Um, very realistic when you're sitting in the vehicle. Difficult to, to show in 2D, but um, trust me, it would, if you're in the immersive environment, uh, you would understand. So there are a lot of use cases available right now in terms of visualization. Um, there's more coming, but you should keep your eye out on that. In terms of process benefits for BIM, I've, I've been through this visualization. Uh, I think it's, it's a huge benefit, one that was um, not quite appreciated when we first started on this path. We were thinking more about the fact that, hey, we can automate the generation of a lot of our drawings, and when things change, they'll all be updated, uh, but uh, really not appreciating at that time how much of a difference being able to um, experience a model through visualization has had. I'm going to talk about BIM coordination, which is um, probably one of the key benefits that the industry is experiencing today. It's um, so-called clash detection, where you go through um, iterations on the model and you remove clashes, problems, coordination issues in the model before uh, they appear. I'll talk more about that. On the construction side, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, 4D modeling where you're adding the dimension of time. Um, so this is an effective technique to leverage in visualization. And I think also there are some tools now that do a tremendous job at um, characterizing or categorizing uh, materials, uh, material quantities for models. And uh, that has been become a, a potential huge benefit, even for designers, to be able to assess the, the cost or, or material of their designs as they evolve. So here's an example, one example of um, construction simulation. This was a um, uh, parking garage project, uh, again in the medical center, and um, the BIM platform was Revit Structure. Uh, the contractor had used Primavera SureTrack as their scheduling system, and essentially in a relatively straightforward fashion, we linked the um, BIM elements with the uh, construction sequencing added some color coding to um, you know, depict different stages like setting forms, setting rebar, pouring concrete, that type of thing. And while you can't, I'm sure you can't read it in the upper left-hand corner of the frame, um, those are actual um, scheduling milestones that are being shown. So you can uh, go backwards and forwards through this model and uh, you have a visual check of what the progress should be um, out in the field. Another example, once again, in the, the Texas Medical Center, those of you in Houston have driven under this bridge if you've been down Fannin, but um, we had a challenge of trying to illustrate to the hospital officials and also to the city of Houston uh, what this construction sequence of a pedestrian bridge that was going across Fannin was going to uh, look like and actually what the timing was. The, the concern was huge about the, the necessity to shut down this major thoroughfare through the medical center. And uh, using this technique, we were able to take a bunch of non-engineers um, well beyond the drawing stage and actually show them precisely what was going to happen. And it really expedited um, the approval process. 
So um, that is uh, an a couple examples of um, a 4D modeling. Let's talk about um, design coordination for a second, which I think is uh, one of the huge benefits uh, that BIM brings to the table today. Typically on a project, almost any project these days, you will, uh, you will see the participants working with their own 3D models. Collaboration process can bring those models together, uh, form a single unified model um, uh, of the facility, and that can be used to actually go through a well-defined programmatic clash detection process. So here's how it works. Um, there is a platform, Navisworks, it's an Autodesk platform, surprise, that um, it does a very good job of reading in 3D files from virtually any platform, um, combining them, and then being able to publish a file that can be consumed with a free viewer. Um, by, so this is a great construct to perform uh, clash detection on projects, even when the designers or the contractors um, are, are not using the same platform, the same 3D platform. Uh, because Navisworks is relative, relatively agnostic, you can uh, bring all those together, find the problems, then issue um, <clears throat> those coordination reports uh, to the consultants on the left-hand side, they can revise their models and uh, repeat the process. So here is uh, um, just one example. It's a biomedical laboratory, and uh, you can see here that um, we had the architect, the structural engineer, and the mechanical engineer engaged. Uh, we had a couple of different platforms in play. This is a, a picture of the structural model. Um, this is a picture of the MEP, so it had all the mechanical components, the electrical components, lighting components, and here is the architectural model. Three separate models independently progressed by different design consultants. Um, here's the combined virtual model in Navisworks, and I've got a little video clip here that can give you maybe somewhat of a sense of what it's like to be able to stitch all these models together and then actually conduct uh, walkthroughs uh, virtually to get a sense of um, how well the different disciplines are, are playing together. And this is not even in virtual reality. You know, we're just looking at 2D screenshot or 2D representations of a 3D screenshot, but it has been revolutionary. Um, to let the stakeholders actually see this stuff come together um, early in design where formative changes can be made. Um, things you could never do, uh, obviously, with drawings. In terms of clash detection, the platform is able to programmatically um, detect uh, issues. So here's a, a screenshot where you can see ducts and piping going through structural members. Um, uh, more. You know, th these are invariably, they show up on every single job, and the real key benefit to using virtual design technologies at, at this early stage is you're able to uh, pick these problems up, detect them, and remove them from the design. Been very successful, very effective, and a huge benefit to the process. Um, here's another project, the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center. This one was in Orlando. You can see a number of different um, participants in terms of delivering 3D models. Fairly complex uh, performing arts theater once you, once you stitched all the models together. And just a screenshot of um, the process. So you know, testing regimes are prescribed and those are run throughout uh, the design. And one of the things that we do is keep track of the comparative history of test results. So as the design is progressing, um, you know, each iteration, you're able to communicate to the team how effectively they are removing uh, issues from uh, the design, which is a um, very helpful process. 
Okay, I'm going to shift into some emerging technologies. Um, laser scan and point clouds we're seeing um, coming more and more in use. Um, uh, this is an example of um, a project we did on the Daytona Speedway renovation. Uh, so we uh, were actually we actually needed to capture to make an accurate model of existing geometry uh, because we were uh, adding uh, new structure to old structure. So uh, we employed um, a surveyor to actually capture uh, a laser scan of the facility, and these are some of the images you're seeing. And, and uh, we were able to go from that laser scan directly to 3D models. Uh, there's also a technology, uh, I don't have time to go into it today, but it's not laser scanning or LIDAR, it is um, uh, uh, photo uh, capture, stitching photos together using a platform like Autodesk Recap, where you can uh, take photos of um, a facility or an object 360 degrees and then technology exists to um, stitch those photos together, create a mesh, and then bring that mesh into design platforms like Revit or Sybil 3D or even uh, virtual reality platforms. Um, so that I think we're going to see a lot more of in the future, uh, especially uh, photo capture using drones. Um, so we've done a little bit of that. We're seeing um, that come more into the forefront. The good news is that that technology will play into this cohort of uh, virtual design technology platforms. Parametric modeling, I mentioned earlier on, uh, is probably the next wave uh, beyond BIM. Uh, it, it uses 3D models, uh, but it takes it to the next level. So here are some tools you might run into Rhino, Grasshopper, Geometry Gym. Um, these things all work with um, Revit structure. Here's an example of, of how to leverage it. This is um, the Atlanta Braves ballpark canopy. And you can see what I'm showing you here is, uh, is a condensed version of um, using um, Rhino and Grasshopper to essentially programmatically adjust parameters on the design of this canopy. So you can go through, um, modify geometric configuration, taking into account um, structural tonnage, which correlates to cost, of course, taking to, an, uh, in this instance, um, shading of the seating area, and literally run through um, hundreds or thousands of design iterations using this technology. Uh, so in, obviously, this is not something that could be done um, his, historically. So we're seeing that uh, take hold and, and provide a, um, a new frontier, so to speak. Here's another example of a evolutionary structural optimization system, uh, BSO 2D. It's kind of an interesting example. Um, the way we used it. Uh, on a retractable, retractable roof stadium design is uh, the system lays down a, a finite element grid. That's essentially that green rectangle you're seeing, which represents the uh, roof membrane of this particular stadium. This was an early rendition of the, um, the LA stadium. Uh, there's a, re a retractable roof that applied a, a force to the edge of that uh, finite element field. And what the software does is uh, goes through on a number of iterations, analyzes the grid, removes elements that are not participating in resisting the force. So here's um, the optimum structural configuration at iteration 85. Uh, and this is what it looks like overlaid on the stadium roof. This was um, the best fit, and uh, this was the proposed arrangement that was informed by the optimization software. So kind of an interesting case study. This was the, um, at the time was Farmers Field, it's no longer that, but 
it show it demonstrates the ability of the, these new um, technologies to impact the design process. And of course, what's on the back of uh, or what's coming next? It, I think it is going to be the realm of AI and machine learning algorithms that are going to make a play in uh, design technologies. Uh, we haven't seen that really come on strong yet, but I can tell you it is in our future. It's another reason why uh, people have to move to a data-centric approach to design, because AI, machine learning, is fueled by data. If you don't have the data, then you're not going to get to, uh, get to play. Then finally, I wanted to make a few comments on um, how this technology is impacting the facilities management space and uh, our thoughts on that. So uh, we talk about this in, internally and externally for that matter as uh, BIM to FIM, Building Information Modeling to Facilities Information Management. I think the, uh, the jury is in and we have seen a tremendous advantage in leveraging uh, a BIM during the design and construction phase. That's been uh, proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. However, when design and construction is done <clears throat> and the owner takes um, occupancy of the building, <coughs> excuse me, moves into operations, all of that digital collateral that was developed really goes by the wayside <clears throat> because the owner is not equipped to use it. So looking for a way to <clears throat> address this shortfall, uh, we have been um, experimenting with this concept of a BIM to FIM system or the creation of a digital twin that, that actually is able to leverage design collateral in the operation side of the business. So um, here, for example, is a, a plug-in to Navisworks that is interfacing directly to the computerized maintenance management system um, that the owner would have on the back end, um, the CMMS, in this case, Tririga. Uh, that's the system that the owners use to maintain all of their uh, facility information, uh, but this is looking for the way to give them a, a visual um, feel to interact with that data. Uh, so it, it's opening the door, I think, for at this point, I would say, more sophisticated um, owners who have an interest in leveraging this technology um, to get a different view. They can walk around virtually in their facilities and simply um, click on a component uh, to interact, pull information from their CMMS, and also push information to it, so interact directly uh, with the system. Um, this information is, is being extracted, for example, real-time in uh, Tririga. And there is a link back to the Tririga system. So what owners are seeing today on their back-of-house data is something like this. It's a 3GL type of an approach. Um, you really have to know the asset number or the tag number to go into this system and get information about it. Um, and that is um, uh, very inefficient. So we're, uh, our idea or vision is really to put in the hands of the facilities managers across the space <clears throat> the ability to interact directly with their equipment uh, by this virtual, uh, by this visual uh, bridge. So ultimately leading to the leveraging of, of digital twins uh, in the operations phase and not having to have operations personnel become literate or experts in this more complex technology that the design and construction side um, is engaged in. So um, having said that, uh, I like this tagline, uh, BIM, it's not about technology, it's about the future. We firmly believe that. Uh, we know that not all parties have made the transition yet, but uh, we we would certainly recommend, if you have not, um, that you seriously consider it because um, it is going to be, it is currently, in my view, the gold standard of design. And um, the older methodologies are going to find their way um, 
to the trash heap. So with that, I will thank you for attending, and um, I guess we'll open it up for any questions. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I've had a couple questions, but if anybody else has any further ones, uh, just click on your link, uh, Q&A, and type in a question. Let me give you the uh, ones I've had so far, Jim. Uh, okay. First, is the cost of the software license an obstacle to use this um, uh, in for public agencies? Well, um, the way I address that is I would say that the the cost of implementation for this is probably three a factor of three to one. So if you look at the cost of the software, multiply that times three, and that is probably close to your ultimate cost of getting your organization, you know, to deploy in, in um, the switch over in a big way. So in terms of public agencies, yeah, I get it that they are very cost uh, controlled. And I think that oftentimes um, they could be short sighted because they're not really looking at uh, the big benefit to cost. So the way we try to handle that is to take a more holistic view and uh, speak to the benefits that, um, that manifest themselves to the project and ultimately uh, the owner. But to be honest with you, I've seen more and more public agencies, especially like the DOTs, that are now starting to become much more interested in, um, in this technology. So I think that's coming. Thank you. The second question, <clears throat> Uh, has to do with uh, the use of BIM for underground utilities and streets. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work done by uh, Sue in investigating utilities, but uh, have you seen BIM used uh, for underground utilities to describe uh, uh, what's there, particularly in uh, maybe in urban centers where the utilities can be pretty uh, overlapping and complex? Yeah, so. Um... We have done some of that work ourselves, uh, where we have access to in the Texas Medical Center. We've done some of that work in Galveston. Um, we've done, we've actually explored um, opportunities with some higher education campuses uh, for you know their folks to um, to map out underground so that they know where things are when they go uh, digging. And I think one of the challenges there is uh, an accurate representation of what's as built. But if you had that, then I think you could, you could certainly leverage it. We try to make an effort on, on new projects um, to make sure that all that stuff is mapped and uh, you know, so it is there for, for the future. I'm not aware of any technology that, you know, like ground penetrating radar, you know, something of that nature that, that can do a really accurate job today of, of creating uh, that digital model. Okay, I, those are all the questions I've uh, seen so far. Uh, take one more, one more look here. No, I don't see any further ones. And uh, well, we sure want to thank you, uh, Jim, for your very informative uh, presentation. Um, it's a um, pleasure. Thank you uh, all, right. all for participating today in the technical webinar. And um, as mentioned before, the individual registrants will receive an attendance acknowledgement without any further action on your part. And for those attending with the group, uh, the site coordinator or the person who signed in will receive the attendance acknowledgement for distribution. If you're interested in presenting a Texas section webinar, please uh, contact Andres Salazar at a salazar at walterpmore.com. You can visit the webinar pages on the ASC Texas section website for a full listing of upcoming sessions, including the leading causes of litigation over the past decade, which will be on the next one on March 10th. So, we appreciate your participation and uh, turn it back to Mike.